Well, we're going to say good morning to those of you who are joining us live and for those of you who are watching and or listening to the recording of today's session, the last of the uh, we'll call it winter uh, slash spring 2024 Aging with Grace series. My name is Seth Stander, and I am the Community Aging Specialist for HHCI Cares, a part of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute that focuses on issues related to caregiving, aging, resilience, ethics, and spirituality. We're glad you joined us for some or all of the series, just some housekeeping beforehand. Regardless of whether you officially registered for all four of our sessions, healthcare rights and responsibilities, legal considerations, uh, the idea of understanding living options, and today's session, paying for aging, we're going to make sure that you receive uh, the links to the uh, recordings for each of these four sessions. We will also make sure that the slide deck for each of these four sessions is sent your way. Again, whether you have the opportunity to be with us live or whether you are being or reviewing any of these sessions uh, at your leisure. And we certainly hope that in addition to these slides, you'll also go ahead and consult the resources tab located on our website, hhci.org. When you go to hhci.org, uh, for those of you who have already navigated it successfully, I would imagine a great deal of you have already as far as clicking on the events tab in order to register for our various educational offerings. In addition to that, of course, we have the resources tab that I mentioned and in reverse chronological order. We'll probably organize that a little differently moving forward. But for now, in reverse chronological order, are a variety of different recordings of programs uh, that you may also find of interest, especially as you are considering all of the factors relating to aging in place versus aging in an independent type of community uh, versus a long-term care setting. And we encourage you, if those recordings, uh, the slide deck, if it is useful to you, to reach out to either the director of HHCI Cares, Dr. Peggy Dettermeyer, or directly to me. Again, I serve as her community aging specialist and across the organization. Uh, you'll find in our slide decks that you will receive our contact information. An email is usually the best way to not only request additional resources based on what videos you may have watched from our website, but also if you're interested in independent consultation uh, relating to any of the matters that fall under the umbrella of CARES. We also encourage you to take a look throughout the remainder uh, of your visit on our website to our clinical services, as well as our educational offerings through Gateway to Hope. Finally, from 5 to 8 p.m., uh, seven days a week, central time, uh, very important to uh, remind those who may not be from our area that we are based in Houston, Texas. Um, we encourage you to make use of, as needed, our Hope Line. If you need a warm line for sharing slash venting, uh, we certainly have attentive and trained listeners to journey with you in addition to whatever else you may wish to schedule during the work week. With all of that said, let's go ahead and dive into today's session on paying for aging. And first and foremost, as we did with legal considerations, we want to make sure that you uh, take a quick peek at our disclaimer. Ultimately, just as you would want to consult an attorney when it comes to anything related to legal documents, documents involving advanced planning and other statuses that eventually might be presented to medical professionals, 
you're going to want to talk to financial planning professionals uh, about any of the different options uh, that we discussed today, especially as we move into, uh, for first timers, applying for federally funded benefits and what that impact may be on your household as you consider options usually apart from aging in place and more in line with securing, say, Medicaid benefits for the purposes of, of paying for a nursing facility bed. Uh, as we mentioned in previous sessions, assisted living facilities are private pay options, although of a, a wide range of, of monthly costs uh, are, are, are available based on geography and amenities, not just basic services to help people with activities of daily living or ADLs, as we've shared in other uh, parts of Aging with Grace. And we encourage you to look back at those to really refresh your memory not just on what constitutes activities of daily living, uh, a critical factor in maintaining not only one's autonomy, but also one's dignity, uh, but also as part of our ongoing mission to help you reinforce your healthcare literacy so that you can be better engaged in care planning for yourself or those who are counting on you to advocate for them, as well as to understand uh, how to speak with professionals in, in legal and, and medical services when it comes to making sure that your needs are heard and that you are truly seen and not just uh, uh, being considered a case. Uh, we are people and we deserve the dignity of being treated as such. And I hope that we're accomplishing that mission here for you as well. So we're going to go through four overarching topics this morning. The costs associated with aging, what Medicare and Medicaid provide. For some of you, you may be very familiar with parts of this section, but may not necessarily have had a need to understand uh, the other aspects of what Medicare and Medicaid provide. Um, we would certainly uh, want to make sure to introduce you to, or again, reinforce your knowledge of what your taxpayer dollars have paid for. Private financial options is a way of helping you begin the brainstorming process when it comes to covering those medical costs associated with the aging process, whether you are aging in place, whether you are aging in a long-term care facility or some other type of independent living, uh, a, a situation where ultimately we want to make sure that your financial literacy along with your healthcare literacy is as robust as possible. And as we do with each of these sessions, we're going to leave you at the end of the slide deck with resources and links, which hopefully will continue to serve you well. In addition to what you see in these slide decks, you can always contact us again uh, through our email uh, or by telephone and request a copy of what we call our CARES Resource Guide uh, or simply CARES Resources. So it is a, think of it as a frequently asked questions document, uh, first created by Dr. Dedemeyer as she was a department of one and expanded upon over the years, uh, certainly in the nearly three years since I joined her in HHCI CARES. And it includes a lot of what we're uh, talking about today in terms of resource sharing uh, and and again, is a, a reinforcement for you all. And if you'd like a copy of our latest edition, all you need to do is email us and we'll make sure that gets out to you. So when it comes to the cost of aging, um, and again, this may be very well review for many of you. Um, some of you are already in a situation where you are paying Medicare premiums, Medicare deductibles and co-pays for various events. And drug copays, assuming that you have prescriptions that you regularly take. In general, and the resource for this statistic is going to be at the end of the slide deck, um, a 65 year old couple 
can expect to pay roughly around $400,000 over a 20-year period for the costs associated medically with the aging process. This, sad to say, does not include the cost of care facilities. Uh, and again, I encourage you to go back to uh, when especially you've got the link to review uh, on understanding living options, that particular section of Aging with Grace, the wide range uh, of, of costs that may be associated with the different types of facilities, be they independent or be they assisted living, licensed or unlicensed, and nursing facilities, which ultimately will help with some to most to all of your various activities of daily living. Again, your ADLs for short. A review by uh, way of, of summarizing a lot of what we discovered uh, uh, together in last week's unit on understanding living options. If you were to go ahead and to bring in a homemaker slash home aid, uh, as opposed to home health care services, which are prescribed services by a physician, you can expect to pay a range out of pocket or in concert with your insurance, be it private or Medicare, or a combination of both if you have supplemental, of anywhere between four to $8,000 a month, depending on how frequently you are asking folks to be engaged with you wherever you live. For those who, regardless of living setting, find themselves uh, interested in uh, or find meaning in participating in some form of adult day health care, which is primarily designed, at least in our community, for those who are experiencing the early and moderate stages of Alzheimer's, dementia, or other type of cognitive decline, uh, roughly $1,600 a month is a fair estimate at this point for the cost of multiple days of, of, of that adult daycare experience uh, for several hours a day, which is important to consider not only for quality of life for the person who is living through that cognitive decline, but also an important understanding of the need for family caregivers especially to experience uh, a respite wherever possible from the responsibilities of family caregiving. Assisted living facilities, uh, and here we are talking about both those which are unlicensed, which is, as you may recall if you've been with us, are three beds or less in the state of Texas, or licensed, which is four beds or more. Now, this is not in terms of who's actually filling them. It's in terms of what their licensed capacity is, four beds and above, three or less. There's more flexibility, but at the same time, once you hit bed number four, you've got to go through the licensing process and all of the certifications and inspections that that entails. You can look at an average price based on a very wide range, I'm afraid, of roughly $37.50 a month, depending on the scope of what you are, are, are looking at. Um, and I say it could be more, and I also say it could be less, which is why I've put in here in the next bullet point, the licensed personal care home, which is an assisted living facility that happens to be in a home setting that has been converted for personal care home use. Uh, it will have four beds or more in order for it to be a licensed facility, but because of the more intimate setting and more importantly, because of the different staff needs, because of the, of the, of the smaller census of residents, you can see facilities, um, again, in terms of what they offer, it may be very basic in terms of amenities, but safe facilities with capable staff for as little as $2,500 a month. And I understand when I say as little as, believe me, I'm not trying to sell anyone on choosing a setting outside of one's home, as we've discussed in previous units, 
well over 80% of people would prefer to age in place whenever it is humanly possible. When it is more beneficial medically, legally, ethically to look at some type of congregate living setting, that's where you want to understand what the basics and the limits of care are going to be which is why assistant living facilities, whether they're big box institutions or licensed personal care homes in the ALF category, uh, have a wider range of costs. But when you get to nursing facilities, and for that matter, when you get to either under the umbrella of assisted living facilities or as units within licensed nursing facilities, the aspect of memory care, Here's where you're talking about roughly 7,200 a month on average and above on geography, amenities, and also degree of need when it comes to you being someone who is in partial need of support with your activities of daily living, or you are in fact a total support need resident. As a reminder, the skilled part of that nursing facility category um, is in parentheses because skilled refers to those activities such as various therapies, physical, speech, occupational, or wound care services, uh, IV antibiotics, and more, uh, where ultimately you may need those as a long-term care resident or you may need them as someone who has elected to go to a nursing facility that has said skilled services for short-term stays. Those short-term stays would be covered, and we're going to talk more about this, by Medicare or your health insurance if you are using private uh, 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 medical insurance, uh, if you haven't aged yet into Medicare. And it's important to understand what it covers from acute care to post-acute care and what it does not, as well as what it covers in a home or other residential type of environment. That's where we're gonna get into more detail today. Quick primer on Medicare versus Medicaid. Medicare is federally funded. For anyone who is 65 years or above, you age into Medicare coverage. If you are, are determined to be medically disabled, you can certainly enter the Medicare coverage at an earlier age. This is to differentiate from Medicaid, which think of it as a block grant given to states who you will either opt in for a base level of Medicaid funding or after the Affordable Care Act came into being uh, Medicaid expansion funding. Some states have chosen to opt in to that expanded federal funding that is available to the states as essentially a block grant, which they distribute on a state by state level. And some for whatever the reason may be, we're not here to discuss politics or, or, or economics, um, they have chosen to opt out of that Medicaid expansion process. Texas, for those of you who are residents uh, and, and fellow Texans, uh, as we again are based in Houston, um, be, please be aware that Texas is one of those states that chose at this point to opt out of post-Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion. That does not mean that Medicaid dollars are lacking. It just means that there are limits to what Medicaid can for you in the state of Texas, primarily with regards to helping to cover the cost of your stay as a long-term care resident in a nursing facility. There is a whole other category of home services under which Medicaid qualifies. And that is a different topic for another time. We will touch upon some of that tangentially, but here we're really focused on when you utilize Medicaid services as a part of paying for a nursing facility bed when medically and financially you are eligible to, to be enrolled in such a facility. 
Now, in terms of overall qualifications, uh, you or your spouse will have needed for Medicare to pay into the system for at least 10 years. Medicaid, as I just mentioned, based on expansion especially, uh, is going to be distributed differently by each state. And it really does depend on you uh, going below the income and financial threshold for eligibility. Uh, I, I wish I could say that it was much higher than the federally established poverty lines. Uh, it is not. It is designed, especially embraced by those states who do embrace the idea that this is a safety net that should be a safety net of last resort. Uh, it is designed to be used only when you have spent down any other savings that may exist in your liquid accounts. And we'll talk more about that in, in a few moments. So a reminder of the, of the different parts of Medicare coverage as they currently exist. Part A, general hospitalization. There is no premium for this. However, there are deductibles that you will pay in order to go ahead and to cover the cost of a hospital stay. I will remind you for those who attended the very first of our sessions on healthcare rights and responsibilities, not only do you retain the right if you enter a hospital to receive detailed itemized billing, uh, not just to understand what is covered at a Medicare negotiated rate, but also what you will be required to pay based on that negotiation out of pocket. Beyond that, you also have the right, and I would argue the responsibility, if you are doing your very best to maintain a roof over your head and to pay for essentials that allow you to live a high of life as high as possible uh, to negotiate how and 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 how and when you will go ahead and pay whatever may be your responsibility by way of deductibles. Negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. For the federal government to negotiate a Medicare rate that, as you can see from an itemized bill, is significantly less than what the out of pocket rate would be that a hospital charges. It is always in your best interest to say, This is what I can afford. Would you rather receive partial payment or none? Because if I attempt to go ahead and to give you all of your payment, I may go without groceries, prescriptions, or even a roof over my head. So where do we go from here? It is an excellent question to ask. And if you don't feel that you are strong enough physically or emotionally to cover that, I truly hope that you will go ahead and utilize family, friends, community in terms of having others advocate for your best interests. Part B is what very often we, we refer to as our major medical coverage for Medicare. Now, both Part A and Part B, uh, I'll say it now so you, when you see the repetition a little bit later, you'll understand when it comes to certain parts of home health care coverage. Sometimes that coverage, uh, it draws from the general hospitalization or Part A benefit, especially if you've landed in a hospital after, say, a fall and a say, a hip replacement, God forbid, uh, whereas Part B uh, may go ahead and cover the very same types of home health care coverage if you haven't been hospitalized for a break, say you have a broken leg, a fracture, but not catastrophic, but also not weight-bearing until you've had a chance to heal at home and you need durable medical equipment and ultimately home health care to come in with physical and occupational therapy. That's where the major medical side may come into play if you were never to the hospital, but rather received urgent care coverage and then a prescription for home health care coverage as you continue to recover at home. Now that does have a sliding scale premium based on ability to pay, and that is of course a function of your income. Part C, also known as Medicare Advantage. 
ultimately it replaces parts A, B, and D. D, of course, is your prescription coverage, which also has a premium depending on the plan that you have chosen. Part C Medicare Advantage plans, of which there are, and you'll see this in the slide deck later on, but it's worth sharing now. In Harris County alone, the county that is the home for Houston and surrounding communities, um, there are dozens of active Medicare Advantage plans that you have the opportunity to pick and choose during uh, enrollment periods and certain uh, 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 un, uh, out of season periods that are driven by life events. Um, they all differ slightly and they're all competing for your business. And all of them are common beyond what they might offer in terms of certain types of coverage, um, in, in, whether it's well coverage, whether it's illness coverage and so forth, um, is that they are very much like HMOs in that you need primary care physician authorization and ultimately making sure that you have a physician that takes Medicare Advantage in the first place to grant that authorization. So it's important to keep these things in mind. If you have a system that's working well for you and a Medicare Advantage plan in that system that is proving to be a savings to you and a convenience to you, wonderful. We're not here to endorse or decry any of these options simply to make sure that you make sure that ultimately the, the primary care physician of your choice and any specialists will take your insurance. And depending on what you need most in a given year, going traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage is a very important question to consider during the enrollment period. We've mentioned in the past that every county and territory in the United States has three essential agencies that can help with every aspect of the uh, Aging with Grace series. One is your Area Agency on Aging, or AAA for short. The other is your Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC for short. And for those of you who are considering or are in fact, enrolled in a long-term care facility, the long-term care ombudsman program of your county or territory is another essential part of the equation. All of these are going to be included in the resource tabs of the, of the different slide decks. So if you're taking notes, that's great, but, but for the sake of focusing, I don't want you to get distracted uh, I, I want to reassure you that you're going to get by email uh, the, the information that has not only the names of these types of organizations specific to Harris County, which if you don't live in Harris County, will be a quick way of getting you to your counterparts in, in your respective environment. Um, but you'll also have an opportunity to check their websites out and explore in greater detail how they will assist you in this particular case, to circle back to today's topic on picking during the annual enrollment period, traditional Medicare versus a Medicare Advantage plan based on to whatever extent you can anticipate your medical needs in the coming year, your prescription needs in a coming year. So a little bit more on Part A Medicare because Beyond the acute care hospital stay, this goes back to the issue that we discussed in our previous session on understanding living options. I'm gonna remind you again that if you have the opportunity because the circumstances permit it, before being discharged from a hospital, if it is appropriate for you to be placed in a long-term acute care hospital or an LTAC for short, or in an inpatient rehabilitation facility or an IRF for short, as opposed to the skilled unit that exists within a nursing facility, I encourage you to consider doing whatever it takes to get into that LTAC or that IRF first. And the primary reason for that is staffing. The staffing needs in healthcare are clear to all of us. No healthcare institution 
is adequately staffed in this day and age. It is a high turnover position, regardless of the level of healthcare being offered, because those who are involved, especially in direct care, have very often your best interests in heart, but they just simply run out of emotional and physical gas. And so turnover is a reality in all of these places. But turnover tends to be highest in the nursing facilities. And when you are relying upon the long-term care nursing facility staff to get you up, washed, dressed, fed, transferred into whatever walker or wheelchair or cane you're going to be using to get to physical occupational skilled therapy, my goodness, um, missed appointments, simply extend your stay and make a waste of that Medicare benefit that is focused on, wherever possible, your physical recovery from whatever puts you in the hospital in the first place. It is a better, smoother experience, relatively speaking, because again, all of these institutions face staffing issues, but it is a relatively smoother experience if you can discharge from hospital to an LTAC or an IRF. Hopefully you've taken a look at the descriptions that are in the bullet points here on what they focus on and the qualifications for those and limits for those. Um, I, I, I really encourage you if, if, if it is at all possible to steer away from a nursing facility unless you have reached that point in life where long-term residency makes the most sense, regardless of how you're paying for it, at least at first. Now, Part A Medicare will also go ahead and cover, in part, again, depending on where you started your medical event, if you were admitted to the hospital, then the prescribed therapy and homebound home health care experiences are going to come, at least in terms of payment source, in part from your Part A Medicare benefit, and then also in part from your Part B major medical benefit. If you went to an urgent care or were not admitted to a hospital before being sent home with a prescription for home health care, then it's primarily going to be your Part B Medicare coverage. Now, let's talk about these other two important bullet points that are on the top half of, the, of, of this slide. Hospice versus palliative care. Think of symptom management, a great way of describing palliative or comfort care as the umbrella under which hospice is just one entity that dwells. People can certainly, as we've discussed in previous units, experience the need for symptom management while they are going through aggressive care. The primary example that we used was chemotherapy and radiation treatment for cancer. And being able to use symptom management alongside of those is critical for one's quality of life and ability to envision uh, not just a physical recovery, but also an emotional recovery from a potential life-limiting illness. When we cannot cure, and when you receive a diagnosis of a terminal illness for which the prognosis is six months or less of life, that is when you would engage in, should you wish, the services of hospice. Hospice would be contracted using your Part A Medicare benefit, or again, your private insurance benefit if you're not using Medicare at this point, to go ahead and to bring in an interdisciplinary team that consists of direct caregivers, such as nurses, CNAs, or here they are referred to as HHAs, home health aides, or hospice health aides, depending on the type of service you're receiving, psychosocial and spiritual services in the forms of social workers, spiritual care coordinators, otherwise known as chaplains, 
Um, it is not a 24 seven sitter service. So keep that in mind because ultimately, depending on a person's decline, they are absolutely going to need family caregivers to continue to play an essential role in maintaining as high a quality of life as possible by administering the medications that are providing symptom management for someone who may be experiencing symptoms accompanying their terminal illness. The important piece about payment for such things is that you can't double dip. If you're going through, say, home health, you can't also be going through hospice because home health is about a trajectory of recovery. Hospice is about maintaining comfort and dignity as one approaches the end of life. Skilled nursing, or if you prefer, IRFs, inpatient rehab facilities, and LTACs, long-term acute care hospitals, let alone going back into the hospital for something related to your terminal diagnosis, that's going to cause you to have to unenroll from hospice in order to receive those aggressive care services. Now, I will say this. If something unrelated to your terminal diagnosis occurs, you have been diagnosed with cancer, it is terminal and you are in a place where your prognosis is six months or less to live. You have discontinued aggressive care and are focusing on comfort care measures, and you slip in the tub, and you need to go to a hospital and have that broken leg surgically set. You don't have to come off of hospice for that. You can ultimately have Medicare pay for that care while also continuing to be under the care of hospice. Worst case scenario, somebody insists that you want to enroll from, for the hospice that you are serving, I would recommend just going ahead and doing it because you need emergency care. And then when you are discharged, re-enroll. Ultimately, you're not going to run out of quote unquote days of hospice because you will be on service so long as you continue to meet the medical qualifications for hospice, even if you have lived far longer than six months. If your terminal diagnosis is typically one for which six months or less of life is expected, you will still prove to be eligible for continued hospice care. Now, I talked about being admitted versus not being admitted to a hospital, and that is going to affect, to a certain extent, whether you can go to a long-term acute care hospital, whether you can go to an inpatient rehab facility. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the three midnight rule or the 30-day window of, of being able to admit into uh, uh, the type of skilled care settings which may accompany your prescription uh, for care, uh, continuity of care at this point after being discharged from the hospital, I am going to go ahead and point out that regardless of how much coverage Medicare provides, which is a maximum of 100 days, uh, by the way, for the type of post-hospital stays that exist within the skilled part of nursing facilities, within inpatient rehab facilities, although it is a different limit for long-term acute care hospitals. You may have seen in the previous bullet point that it's a 60-day maximum that's there. That is open to interpretation, but again, cross that bridge should you ever need to, not worry about it right now in theory. I will point out that what an eligible payable event is for Medicare and by extension for private insurance as well is typically a 60 day break between what you were previously uh, having Medicare or your other insurance pay for in terms of recovery services versus being able to access that benefit again from day one. Um, it, 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 it really does need to be 60 days, roughly two months um, of, of you not experiencing relapses of the same condition. Uh, now, this, this could sound to some of you absurd, except if you are prone to falls, God forbid, and you have fallen 
and you have severely sprained, say, an ankle, enough so that you need skilled rehabilitation services. And whether it is part of inpatient rehab facility services at first, or perhaps you're in the skilled part of a nursing facility getting uh, physical rehab, um, you go home. And within that 60-day period, you go ahead and you fall again, but this time you break something. Not that same angle, mind you, although it could be technically the same. It's a different event. If, on the other hand, you re-sprain the same ankle within that 60-day window, it's going to be a tough, tough sell to go ahead and have Medicare declare that to be a separate event. So it's important to understand that the goal of using these Part A and Part B uh, covered services is to make sure that you don't have a quick turnaround back into an emergency room in the first place. That is so important that hospitals, inpatient rehab facilities, LTACs, the skilled parts of nursing facilities, um, there are penalties, financial penalties that they can experience if you cross through their thresholds within a certain period of time uh, after you have been there to recover from a particular event that brought you into starting with the hospital um, and, and followed by the, the follow-up services into that sphere of influence in the first place. So keep in mind that anyone who has ever experienced uh, the dreaded notice of Medicare non-coverage letter being received at your bedside um, at a, especially an inpatient rehab facility, an LTAC, or in a nursing facility's skilled section, um, it is absolutely your right to go ahead and to ask for that to be reviewed. Uh, and you can talk to long-term care ombudsman in particular to walk you through that process. Don't wait. Um, because ultimately you want as quick and as thorough a medical review of that as possible so that ultimately you can stay as long as you need to so that you don't repeat the injury that brought you into the healthcare system in the first place. For your benefit, I've included the most up-to-date coinsurance amounts, and you'll see other numbers like this in the slide deck. I'm not going to focus on these for the purposes of today's discussion, but rather to make you aware that they exist and that ultimately you're going to want to confirm your benefits, your coinsurance costs for this year and subsequent years every time you're working with an institution's financial services. Part B Medicare, in addition to what I mentioned previously, about durable medical equipment, that part of home health care services that accompanies the skilled services such as therapy, wound care, and more. Um, you can see here that a good bunch, uh, a good deal of DME or durable medical equipment's uh, uh, abbreviation, if you will, that's commonly used. Um, with a five-year replacement period is going to include some items, but not all. It's important to keep that in mind. Big ticket items, such as beds, wheelchairs, commodes, things like that are going to be covered. Shower chairs? Sadly, no, because someone can receive a bedside wash. Walkers? If you want a walker, you're not going to get a wheelchair covered. If you already own a wheelchair and you want a walker, God bless, go ahead and get that covered. If it's appropriate for you to use it as a part of your recovery process, remember that your ability to safely not just transfer, but ambulate falls under the categories of activities of daily living. For outpatient medications, injectables, infusions, for diagnostics, for outpatient visits, which is going to include outpatient therapy, not home health care services coming to you for therapy, lab work, preventative services, and any other medically necessary services and supplies. The payer source for that is going to be for Medicare holders, your Part B section. 
Now, again, if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, Part A, Part B, and Part D, the prescription coverage, are going to all be covered under the umbrella of whatever that particular Medicare Advantage plan will cover per event. I've mentioned the home health care services, and it's important, again, for you to look at this on your own time in greater detail. Having said that, two important points. Companies, this is towards the bottom of the page, may claim, because they get paid less per day the longer you're on service, that you are no longer uh, eligible for skilled therapies at home. You're going to need to double check that claim whenever it comes up, and it will. Uh, you need your doctor. You're going to need, in this case, because you are at home, the Area Agency on Aging to get involved to make sure that you are getting the proper medical evaluation to determine whether or not the company truly believes you've recovered beyond the need for skilled therapies at home or or not they are attempting to simply excuse you from their, from their service so they can go ahead and get someone who is in an earlier stage of recovery and receive a higher daily payment. I wish that this weren't the case, but again, limited staff, and if you're trying to make ends meet, you may very well go ahead and say, Logistically, it makes more sense for me to have people in the earlier stages of recovery than the latter stages of recovery remain on service. And if I can talk them into voluntarily excusing themselves from service by saying, well, you're really no longer eligible, you should withdraw. That's something that you should absolutely confirm with your doctor and get the AAA in your community involved so that they can go ahead and remind that home health care service provider that that is not ethical or legal. Now, the law does prescribe that up to 28 to 35 hours a week of home health aid and nursing services, this is the important word combined, will be covered so long as it has been prescribed by Medicare. How that is divvied up is an important part of your care planning process. Use the social worker in the home health care services to go ahead and to help you determine what the right balance is. You may very well need more home health aid service than nursing service, depending on the nature of your recovery, or it may be reversed. It depends on, say, whether or not you are primarily using home health care services uh, to help you successfully transfer and bathe and, and dress so that you can engage in, in various physical and occupational therapies, or whether they're primarily there for wound care and IV antibiotic therapy and so forth. So what brings you to home health care services is important in terms of balancing out which parts of the interdisciplinary team are coming to you and when. The, the medical social workers in home health care services are supposed to help you figure that out. And if they're not, go to your area agency on aging and see what you can do to get them to see uh, uh, your point of view, shall we say. A reminder to you that because Part B Medicare, traditional Medicare, has a monthly premium, it is based on your modified uh, adjusted growth income, uh, gross income, uh, excuse me, uh, the unintended lisp there. Um, and so whether you file your taxes individually or jointly, I provided for you a current chart of the monthly premium amounts based on the ranges for your modified uh, adjusted gro uh, gross income. Uh, although, honestly, I could have gone farther. If individually you're making more than half a million a year filing individually or 750 grand a year filing jointly, you're probably not in this program uh, and good for you. But you may be the ally of somebody who isn't blessed with the ability to, to declare such uh, modified uh, uh, adjusted gross income, in which case I certainly hope you're paying attention to be your loved ones or friends 
uh, or community members best advocate as they go ahead and navigate how to uh, calculate their monthly budget, which will include the monthly premium on top of any other costs uh, for such important things, again, as keeping a roof over their heads, eating, uh, medications, and more. I've already covered, uh, in, to some extent, Medicare Part C. I do want to go ahead and point out that some of the supplemental plans, which is why there's a wide range, at least 60 plans. When I said dozens, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't kidding. Um, uh, currently, uh, in Harris County alone, with regards to the types of coverage that exist, including supplemental plans, uh, that include dental uh, and vision and hearing aid coverage. Um, In-home supports and modifications are an option that might be available to you. The important thing, again, to consider here is whether or not the flexibility you have with that Medicare Advantage plan to get the care you want, because you have a primary care physician who will accept that Medicare Advantage plan and then refer you to the specialty services that you need. Um, it's important to make that determination on an annual basis when you're weighing maintaining a Medicare Advantage plan of whatever type you choose to enroll in um, versus going to or back to traditional Medicare. Medicare Part D, and this is, this is actually good news. Um, for years, we talked about what was referred to as the coverage gap, or more colloquially, the donut hole, when it came to um, uh, paying uh, out-of-pocket for drugs once you reach a certain limit in terms of what Medicare Part D was going to cover during a given year. Starting in 2020, um, when you hit the donut hole period or the coverage gap period, um, the amount that you were responsible for was reduced to about 25% of the, of the drugs that you might need on a regular basis. Starting in 2025, thanks to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress and signed into law in 2022, retirees are going to see drug co-payments cap at $2,000 a year, which from a policy standpoint, is going to effectively end the need to even discuss the donut hole or coverage gap starting next January. So good news coming for those of you who are currently enrolled in or anticipate being enrolled in some form of Medicare and dealing with Part D coverage, whether through traditional or under the umbrella of a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, Medicaid is, as we said, a very different animal altogether. It is a health coverage program for low-income adults, for children, for the elderly, for the disabled. It is funded by the states and the federal government. The federal government will go ahead and essentially give money block grant style to states, whether they accept some or all of the possible monies that are available to them especially post Affordable Care Act expansion of Medicaid coverage um, is up to state government. And again, Texas only has accepted a portion of what the federal government allows Texas to accept. If you don't like that, I will simply say that elections have consequences. That's as political as I get, folks. Now, I've mentioned traditional Medicaid in the past in discussion in terms of how it might go ahead and help to offset the costs, out-of-pocket costs that may remain to you when it comes to home health services, uh, durable medical equipment, infusion care, and hospice. These numbers, by the way, in terms of out-of-pocket should be minuscule to none uh, because customarily Medicare covers these all at 100%. But if you run into exceptions to the rule and in a broad-based general overview such as this, we can't really get into those in detail. 
it's nice to know that you do have some limited coverage in case paying out of pocket would cause you to be further impoverished and go without other daily, weekly, or monthly essentials in your household. Now, there is a form of HMO Medicaid. This is primarily if you fall into the disabled category uh, in terms of, of, of Medicaid. Ultimately, um, any of the services that we've mentioned previously are going to be available to you so long as you receive primary care physician pre-authorization. The difficulty, again, is finding someone in the medical community who is willing to accept Medicaid as a payer source, or for that matter, Medicare, traditional or Medicare Advantage as a payer source. Assuming you have found that person, that is who you will be relying upon, just as if you had an HMO at a time when you were working and that was the private coverage that was available to you. So keep that in mind, that pre-authorization under that form of Medicaid is what matters. This form of Medicaid is also what is coupled with your applied monthly income going to cover the cost of a nursing facility stay, assuming you reach both the medical necessity and the financial uh, 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 level in which Medicaid benefits fully kick in. Typically, you'll pay for a nursing facility under those circumstances by going ahead and having your monthly applied income, which if you are in such a financial eligibility level, usually means just your social security. There may be a small pension involved. Uh, and when all is said and done, you're ultimately gonna be going ahead and paying out that entire monthly applied income minus what is called a personal needs allowance, a minuscule amount of money for discretionary spending for a resident each month. When coupled with that form of Medicaid benefit, that covers every aspect of your stay, although the formulary for some of the items that you may need medically during your stay, one of the biggest examples that comes up very often for ombudsman is pull-ups. When someone needs some type of a pull-up to sleep in and the facility doesn't offer what you or your loved one may have been using beforehand and says, it's not on the formulary, you're gonna to have to cover that out of pocket, but we will cover this and this is barely acceptable to you, the product that they have chosen to stock in the facility. That's where you also talk to a long-term care ombudsman to see whether or not they will make a business decision to go ahead and to include your particular product uh, in the formulary that they use. Sometimes people will get to reasonable conclusions, which is why, just as I mentioned before about out-of-pocket costs in hospital stays, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. This is going to be for your benefit later in terms of understanding what the current individual income caps are and financial asset limits and again, to be perfectly clear, financial assets in this case, for the purposes of Medicaid eligibility, do not include your home, your car, an irrevocable funeral trust or prepaid funeral plan. Those are all excluded from Medicaid eligibility consideration. Ultimately, you can't just form other types of quick trusts, exclusive of what I just mentioned, because there is a five-year look-back period when it comes to your financial eligibility. And if it, it looks like you're shielding money um, that could otherwise be spent before you're eligible for Medicaid, that is going to interfere with the application process. A lot more can be said on that, but that really is another topic for another day. Two other important pieces, though, that I want you to be aware of, the terms at least, and we can talk in individual consultation or direct you to the appropriate agencies, uh, like the Area Agency on Aging, to discuss this in greater detail. 
if you are married and one spouse has reached the point where nursing facility care is appropriate and they need to go into a nursing facility and, and, and receive a bed there, but you, the spouse of that individual, still need to pay for all of the regular monthly costs associated with maintaining your household. The concept of spousal impoverishment is a very important one to consider because there are increased financial limits for the non-applicant, that is to say the spouse who doesn't need nursing facility care, that they can maintain in order to make sure that you do not go destitute while your loved one is using Medicaid benefits with their applied income to cover their nursing facility stay. Having said that, it is important to discuss with the appropriate agency, perhaps even with an attorney, what to do if states like Texas, not every state does it, but Texas is one of the ones that does, um, comes to you after the death of a loved one who has used Medicaid benefits, especially for covering a nursing facility stay, and tells you that they are now going to go ahead and apply MERP, the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program. In other words, they consider what the payments to the nursing facility coupled with that, that person's monthly applied income to be is essentially a loan. There are ways around it. Again, financial and also having to do with uh, whether or not you would become uh, house poor or homeless as a result of in putting MERP into place after an individual dies. They don't always come around for collection. It's important for you to prepare your response should they do so. And that is best done through the Area Agency on Aging, through an attorney who is familiar with MERP and how to protect your assets. Now, there are, as you can see, a number of different slides that ultimately talk about the criteria for long-term care. Um, what I will focus in on here ultimately and give you a chance to look later on at, at, at the rest of the slide decks on this is that ultimately what we want to do is to make sure that a person who is in need of routine care that can no longer safely be done at home is in a long-term care facility, whether you are private paying, whether you are uh, spending down until you reach eligibility for Medicaid benefits, um, that they are admitted to that long-term care facility through a physician's order, and that new nursing supervision is, is, is a part of their daily need moving forward because they cannot safely handle their daily regimen, let alone uh, any type of extended medical regimen. The financial options for this, I don't wanna rush through the topic. So what I'm going to do for today is to simply say that the rest of the slide deck that you will receive are going to be essentially ticklers, points for you to consider about the pros and cons of purchasing long-term care insurance, which may pay out a daily rate that either covers in full or heavily subsidize the daily rate that you might otherwise pay out of pocket for an assisted living facility or nursing facility stay. Short-term care insurance, hybrid life and long-term care, more restrictions, but fundamentally the same concept as long-term care insurance. Obviously, as the names imply, they are either for a far more limited time which could prove useful if someone is reaching the point where say they are in hospice care and you can no longer meet their needs outside of when that interdisciplinary hospice team comes to visit them at home uh, as a caregiver. Enrolling them in short-term care insurance with that need or eventuality in mind may very well give you the opportunity to put them into some type of limited 
care, long-term care setting. Again, don't get confused by the terminology, short-term care insurance. What we're really talking about here is something that's going to either offset end-of-life care, which is expected to be of a shorter duration in an institutional setting, or we're talking about offsetting the out-of-pocket expenses that eventually will accompany starting with day 21 after Medicare covers, say, your short-term stay for physical recovery purposes in a skilled facility. Um, after that, you begin to have a daily copay and short-term care insurance can cover that. So it's not all doom and gloom. And the hybrid plan is certainly one in which if you don't use it, it becomes a transferable asset to your beneficiaries. Savings, reverse mortgages, annuities, they all are under the umbrella of assets that you hold, either already in liquid form, in an accessible form, in terms of the payout of an annuity, or in terms of taking a paid for property and following appropriate legally established protocols, creating essentially what is what was before you owned the property, uh, a line of equity account. Um, uh, think of it in those terms. I'm not here to sell you on what, what, whether or not it's right for you, but rather to ask you to consider reframing if you immediately have an aversion to it without doing your due diligence to determine whether or not it makes the difference between, say, being able to afford to age in place by putting a line of equity credit on your home and utilizing the, the, the liquidation of funds as a result of doing so versus not doing so and having that asset potentially come under the, the Medicaid estate uh, 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 reimbursement program. And what do you need to do to try and protect that asset from going back into the government coffers um, when, and here's where I guess my bias comes into play, um, you've already paid for it. After all, if you contributed into Medicare and Medicaid uh, as a worker, then this is a plan for which you should be entitled. Entitlement does not mean you always get under all circumstances, but fair entitlement is if you paid into it and if you qualify medically, you should be able to, when you qualify financially, to use Medicaid as an example, to help pay for a nursing facility bed without worrying about whether your survivors can keep your house, what will ultimately be their house. So as you can see, the categories that I just talked about are in greater detail as you go through all of these slides. But I wanna take the last few minutes to just make sure that again, you get to the end of each of these slide decks because there are going to be resources that are gonna help you in terms of educating yourself more on each of these general topics we've covered through the Aging with Grace series, as well as direct uh, 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 source assistance, such as the Area Agency on Aging, in this case for Harris County, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, in this case for Harris County. Um, having a better understanding of what the different types of Medicare Advantage plans, if that is something you are interested in considering versus traditional Medicare in a given year. Um, having a better understanding of the pros and cons of one plan over another versus any Medicare Advantage plan as opposed to traditional Medicare coverage in a given year. Those are just some examples. And we also want to make sure that beyond that, you've got some reference material that will help you understand, at least from, if not our state, um, from other states and from the federal government through the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS.gov, um, understanding how these are supposed to work. Now, 
you're going to see some links in here at the time these were put together. They didn't quite have the 2024 information completely up, but from here, you can get to the uh, these links, you can get to the current year's links, and the data from those links is current in the earlier slides that I presented to you today. Some new stories that go ahead and help, and I think Lisa Falkenberg's two stories on this slide are essential reading. If you're having any difficulty accessing them, contact us and we'll make sure that we do what we can to get those to you. Uh, one of them has to do with the whole issue of insurance coverage for acute and post-acute care needs. And the other has to do with ultimately, what do you need to do to make sure that you don't go bankrupt while covering your out-of-pocket costs? As I mentioned, um, the slide decks, each of these uh, slide decks in the four-part series we've, we've now completed, hard to believe, um, include the contact information for both Dr. Dedemeyer and for myself. We encourage email, especially if you want to schedule individual consultations or desire specific resources above and beyond the links to the recordings for this series and the slide decks for this series. And with that, I want to say thank you to those of you who have participated either throughout this period of time um, uh, or sessions or whether you have attended just a session or, or perhaps two. Um, and we hope that all of the slide decks, all of the links to the recordings will at some point prove useful to you or to someone you know. And if we can help navigate or reinforce anything that's been discussed, please don't hesitate to contact us. Have a kind and gentle week, everyone. God bless. Thank you.